Really excited about the passage that we have before us today, as I am with every passage that we open up and we want to be instructed by. Um, it's a passage that really needs to be connected to uh, the text that we dealt with last week, right? I mean, anytime we take a text, we've got to consider it in context. And we're going to get to all that in just a moment. Hold that thought. I would like for us to uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer uh, for a moment. We have some things that I want to just highlight in your bulletins. Um, you guys uh, may have received an email concerning Fred and Jean Faltasak uh, this week. Uh, we need to be praying for the Faltasaks. Um, Fred and Jean, they tune into our live stream uh, every Sunday. They are faithful attenders of church in the only way possible for them to attend, which is through our live stream. But Jean is asking for prayer, uh, relief from extreme, extreme pain in her leg. Uh, wound care continues to be a real challenge for Jean. Um, and to have increased mobility is her desire. She is uh, rather immobile because of the wound care that she consistently receives. And Fred is uh, healing from pneumonia, but he too has ongoing mobility issues and uh, we need to be praying for the fault of sacks. They do have uh, care that comes and, and, and assists them in their home, but, um, but they really do, are facing quite a challenge. I'd like for us to be praying for Sherry LeClaire. Um, I mean, just imagine uh, losing your son, one of two sons, and then losing your husband in a matter of weeks. Uh, she has had quite a difficult challenge, and we need to continue to pray uh, for Sherry. Um, Bryce Williams, I see, is here today, and he continues to uh, to wait for both a, a kidney and a, a liver transplant, and he was dealing, I actually talked with him on a soccer field uh, this week, and he's he didn't think he'd be here today because he may end up on dialysis, but lo and behold, here he is. So we need to be praying for Bryce as he uh, continues to face that that challenge in his life, and uh, and 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 you can just see the the list of folks who are dealing with very real physical issues. Uh, the Telepos are here, and and brother is waiting for uh, a transplant of his own, and um, and here he continues to to attend. So, uh, people who are faithful attenders dealing with very real physical issues. I just want to go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your goodness. Uh, we know that you are the great physician. We know that you are able uh, to, to heal. And so, Father, we place these matters at your feet, and we come before your throne of grace, and we ask that you would intervene in these matters concerning the physical condition of Fred and Jean, of Bryce, of Mike. Father, I just lay them all at your feet. Father, we know that you desire what is best for us, and what we desire may not be what you desire. Nevertheless, Father, we just pray that you would work mightily in these folks' lives. If nothing else, Father, draw them unto yourself, spiritually speaking, that they may sense your presence and know that they are being comforted by the great comforter. Thank you, Father, for working in our midst here at Calvary Bible Church. I thank you for the good things that you are doing. I thank you for these folks who love you dearly. And just pray, Father, that you would continue to draw us close unto yourself, that we would desire what you desire, that this church would be a unified body who desires to to know Jesus Christ and who desires to make him known in our community and abroad. Thank you once again for this time. We commit it to you. Pray that you would be honored and glorified, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus had answered the scribe's question in chapter 12, verse 28. The scribe had come to Jesus, and uh, he had heard them, meaning the religious leaders, disputing uh, with Jesus. And he came up to him, seems to have had a different heart than the previous question askers who were trying to trip him up. And he came and he asked him a question, which commandment is the most important of all? And um, Jesus' response gave us last week incredibly rich instruction about how genuine believers ought to relate to God and to one another. Genuine believers love God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, and they love others as they love themselves. Love God, love people. That is a mark of genuine faith. And so, really, the Lord's response 
essentially addresses the essence of genuine faith. Know who God is, love him supremely, love each other sincerely. That's the context. The scribe affirmed Jesus' response, agreed with Jesus' summation of the whole law. Jesus said, you can take the whole law, and I'm not going to give you one great commandment. I'm going to give you a second great commandment. I'm going to combine them both, and we're going to, sum we're going to summarize the entirety of the law. And that's what Jesus did in his response. Jesus saw that the scribe affirmed Jesus' response, and which was to love God supremely and love others sincerely. And Jesus saw that he answered wisely, and he said to him, listen, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You are not far from the kingdom of God. The scribe was not far from the kingdom of God. He correctly summarized all that Jesus said, and Jesus turns to him and says, you're not far. He gave the right answer, but Jesus, who knows the heart, must have concluded that he didn't have the right heart. Right answer, not the right heart. All, in quotes, all he needed to do was to believe in the person of Jesus, to confess his sins, which means to agree with God concerning his sin, which separates him, and then to repent, which means to turn around and head in the other direction. That's all he had to do. He had the right answer. Evidently, he did not have the right heart. True Christians, so he was not far, true Christians understand how to operate in the kingdom of God. True Christians understand how to operate. As a genuine believer, they know how to live the Christian life. That's what I mean by operate in the kingdom of God. They know how to live the Christian life. Those who are near, or far for that matter, from the kingdom of God do not know how to live the Christian life because they are not in Christ. It's as simple as that. Christians should have, listen, listen, and kids especially, perk up, listen, here's the deal. Christians should have a kingdom perspective of life. Christians should have a kingdom perspective of life, viewing life through a Jesus lens, if you will. Christians should have a kingdom perspective of life. And so we can capture this with a big idea statement. And here's it, here it is. If we have a, what kind of perspective? A kingdom perspective. If we have a kingdom perspective, then we will see things as Jesus does. A kingdom perspective or a kingdom view, if you will. That's an easier word, right, guys? If we have a kingdom view or a kingdom perspective, we will see things as Jesus sees them. So let me ask a question. What evidence do genuine Christians give of understanding how to live this Christian life? What evidence do they give of understanding how to live the, king, the, the kingdom life? What evidence do they give? Well, number one, they have a kingdom perspective of Christ. They have a kingdom perspective of Christ. Now, Dale just read a moment ago, and we're going to walk through this passage. Now, at first glance, you might, you might have heard Dale reading and thought, wow, we have three different ideas going on here. Au contraire. We've got to connect this to the passage previously, and you're going to see that there is a common thread that flows through the whole thing. It's not three different vignettes. We've got three connected issues here that all tie into the, the first and the second greatest commandment. Love God supremely, love others sincerely. The question is, what is the evidence in the Christian life that we love God uh, supremely and we love others sincerely? What evidence will we see? Evidence number one, a kingdom perspective of Christ. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. Jesus has patiently and masterfully answered disingenuous questions. Do you see what's happening now? Now he's going to ask the questions. And he asks a good question. It's not a trip-up question. It's a legitimate question, a good question. And so he is going to ask this question. 
And instead of asking a trap question, he gets right to the heart of the matter. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? There's a parallel account. Matthew chapter 22, verse 42 puts it this way. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Or here's another way. Uh, 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 Matthew chapter 22, verse 42, rather. Here's, here's the parallel. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? This is a far more important question than the questions his enemies had been asking him, which were ridiculous most recently. Because you know what kind of a question this is? It's a question concerning identity. It is a question of identity. Essentially, Jesus asks, do you really know who I am? Do you know who you're talking to? And since Jesus is the Christ, he's speaking about himself. If we are wrong about Jesus Christ, listen, we, the scribes then and people today, if we are wrong about Jesus Christ, his person, and his work. If we are wrong about Christ, then guess what? We are wrong about salvation. And if we are wrong about salvation, we risk condemning our own souls. We can't be wrong about Christ. We have to have a proper Christology. We have to understand who Jesus is and what really he did and is doing. We cannot be wrong about Christ. They said to him, Jesus asked the question in the Matthew account. They said to him, the son of David. Jesus asked, he asked, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said, the son of David. You know what? They were right in a way, but they were not thorough. They didn't completely understand. They were right. They said he is the son of David because the scribes were the teachers of the law. They studied it religiously, no pun intended. And they taught that the coming Messiah would be born in the genealogical line of King David, and he was. So they were right in that regard. John chapter 7 affirms this. John chapter 7, verses 41 and 42 Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Because remember, nothing good comes from, comes from that region. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David? So they knew their Old Testament. They knew, they knew the law and the prophets. And comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there was a division among the people over him. So... Verse 36, we read, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. We could translate that. Maybe it sounds confusing. Here's a, here's a way we could translate that. We can translate that line this way. The Lord God said to my Lord Master, sit at my right hand. Now, this is a quote from Psalm 110. Psalm 110 begins in this fashion. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This is a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord. So as a coronation psalm, this would have been used at every coronation of the kings of Israel. And they would have read this. Jesus wants to know that if there's no greater king than King David, if there's no greater king than he, how is it that David refers to his own son as Lord? How can that be? Like I said, Matthew chapter 22, verse 42, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And the answer is that the Messiah, Jesus, standing before them is not merely the son of David. Listen, he's the son of God. So they got it right on the one hand, he is from the line of David, but they didn't see that he was the son of God. That's the, most important, that's the most important piece of his identity, is that he is the Son of God. In fact, Mark started this whole journey that we've been on. This entire gospel began with these words. In the, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's what this is all about. It's all about identifying who Jesus is really is. 
The only way David's son could also be David's Lord would be if the Messiah were God come in human flesh, and therein lies the rub. They didn't see the Messiah right in front of them. They didn't have an understanding of the true identity of the Messiah from the line of David. In that sense, physically speaking, he is David's son. But in the other sense, he is the son of God. In fact, flip it, he is God the son. They didn't see his divine identity. The scribes were looking. Here's the problem. They were looking for a human king. They were looking for a conqueror. They were looking for a liberator. They were looking for someone who is going to free them from Roman control. They were looking for a respite from the physical, physical control that they had been under. And they did not see, and they were blinded to the spiritual king of the universe who is present at creation right before their very eyes. So as they quote the written word, the living word is interpreting it for them. And he's standing right before their very eyes. So the only way that David's son, this is the answer to the question, the only way that David's son could also be David's Lord would be if the Messiah were God come in human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. So the matter was resolved in the Lord's miraculous conception and virgin birth. The scribes were looking for a human king, but Jesus is much more than a human king. He is the divine king, the Son of God. So when the Messiah finally came, and he was there right before them, they missed him altogether because they were looking in the wrong direction. They were looking for the Messiah, and here he is right here. The scribes had an inadequate view of Messiah. They had, they had really narrowed their view to looking for the physical. And he was physically present. But he was the divine son of God. And I guess the question, as, as we are saying that really, to answer our question for today, what evidence do genuine Christians have? What, what evidence do genuine Christians give of understanding how to live the Christian life? Well, a very important piece of evidence is that they understand the true identity of Jesus. And not just identity, but they have an adequate view of Jesus. They have an adequate view of Jesus. Some people know that Jesus came to be a teacher. He was a good man. He was a good example. He was a model. But they fail to see that he came to free us from our sin and that he is sufficient to do that and has already done that. Others know that he came to be our Savior, but they fail to see that he is our King, our Supreme King. And so a lack of submission to his Lordship is problematic. Maybe, the, maybe that's the deeper issue, is that people don't submit to his Lordship. They don't love him the way that they should. And when our lives get messy and, and what we know to be true about Jesus is replaced with our own anxieties and our own concerns, then maybe our view of Jesus, which is inadequate, begins to challenge where we, where we place our feet as we live our lives. I guess another way of asking the question is, is our view of Jesus the same on Tuesday as it is today? So do we have a kingdom perspective of Christ is the question. Do we have a kingdom perspective of Christ? The root of the problem is simple. The religious leader's view of the Messiah that they were anticipating was wrong. And do you have an inadequate, an inadequate or do you have a faulty view of Jesus? Is he sufficient just as much so when times are good as he is when times are bad? Or do you tend to grab the reins and try to control your circumstances on your own? That's a, these are the kinds of challenges that we all have to face. The reality is, is that Jesus is the son of David, but he is also the son of God. And more significantly, he is the son of God. Jesus was 100% man, and therefore he was able to be the physical sacrifice that he needed to be to take upon himself the sins of the world, past, present, and future, so that we would have a chance of escaping condemnation. 
Because he was a man, 100% man, he was able to be that sacrifice. And because he was 100% God, that enabled him to be the only acceptable sacrifice as perfect. Because he was the only perfect sacrifice that would be acceptable to Almighty God. 100% God, 100% man. From the line of David, divine, king of the universe. That's an adequate view of Christ. And to apply it, that adequate view drives the way that we live the Christian life. So that we don't have a yeah, but mentality as we look at scripture and as we measure that against how we view our circumstances in this life. So genuine Christians, genuine Christians should understand how to live the Christian life because they have a kingdom perspective of Christ. They also have, number two, they also have, number two, a kingdom perspective of serving. They have a kingdom perspective of Christ and a kingdom perspective of serving. Serving God by serving others. So if we look at verse 38, and in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. This paragraph teaches, sadly, that there have always been religious men who prey on the needy. This is not a 21st century phenomenon of unscrupulous men who wear a mask of, of, uh, of religiosity in order to compel people to give so that they can benefit. This is not new. This dates all the way back to this passage right here and further back. Jesus warns, beware of the scribes. The issue here is not what the scribes are teaching, but it's how they're living. It's how they're living. They don't have a kingdom view for serving God and serving people. They're living hypocritical, two-faced lives. Now, what they were teaching, they, they had some theological issues going on there. But as for this moment right here in this text, the issue is, that, uh, is, is of how they're living. And we see the examples Jesus gives them. Verse 38 Verse 38, and in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes. What do they do? They like to walk around in long robes. They like to walk around in long robes. And they like to be greeted. It's all about appearances for them. It's, it's all about playing the part, looking the part, and, and receiving the accolades publicly, which puffed them up in their hypocritical stance. So they wanted to appear one way, but they are actually behaving in a very different way. James chapter 2 speaks to the next issue that, that we have recorded here in the text. They like greetings in the marketplaces, verse 39, and have the best seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at feasts. They took the best seats in the synagogues. They had reservations for their seats, the best seats in the synagogues. And, and they made sure that they were in a place of prominence. Why? So that they could be viewed in a certain way. They were hypocritical, two-faced, religious elites. They were, in that period of time, the elitists, the religious elitists of Jesus' day. What else did they do? They recited long, eloquent prayers. Look at Luke chapter 18, you'll get an example of the kinds of, um, of prayers. Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, verse 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. You see, that's what they did. That's what the religious leaders did. They, they trusted in themselves, and they, they wanted attention. They wanted accolades. They wanted uh, wonderful greetings so that people would know the great religious leader that they were. 
but they treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray. Now, this is a parable, okay? So he's teaching. He's laying two people side by side. He's teaching a lesson here. But it's not out of the realm of possibility. This sort of thing happened. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, will not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus is teaching a lesson. These Pharisees, these scribes, they recited long, eloquent prayers. They were not talking to God. They were talking so that other people could hear and so that they could be recognized for how great of a prayer and how great of a religious elitist they actually were. Rotten hearts on the inside. And Jesus says, that's not a kingdom perspective of serving because you're serving yourself. Verse 40. They devoured widows' houses. Hmm. The phrase devour widows' houses, does that make any sense to you at all? What do you mean? They consumed their house? They ate their house? What is, what is this? Well, another way we could translate this phrase is they greedily, they greedily cheat widows out of their property. They greedily, widows. So a woman has lost her husband. Maybe she had six brothers of her original husband who came along. You remember that story? It was not uncommon for a husband to appoint in his will a Jewish legal expert, a scribe or a Pharisee. They can be trusted, right? Well, they would be the executor of that widow's estate that was given to her because of the death of her husband by the will. And it would not be hard for a corrupt lawyer, scribes were lawyers, it would not be hard for a corrupt lawyer to find legal ways to trick a widow out of her house and perhaps out of her other property. And this was precisely what the religious leaders were doing. And Jesus denounced the scribes and he denounced the Pharisees as religious hypocrites who were so spiritually callous that after greedily pilfering from the needy, they would put on a public show speaking long, eloquent prayers to get people to view them as religiously pious, while they just built a woman out of her home and out of her property, saying things like, just in faith, step out. God will, 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 will give this back to you tenfold, a hundredfold. And they would take scripture quoting it out of context, and they would get this woman to hand over what she has, and she would then be left destitute with nothing because they desired it for their own gain as they built their massive wealth, doing this sort of thing over and over and over again. The system was corrupt, and the darkness of the scribes' greed makes the widow's sacrifice in this account shine even more brightly. Their life was inconsistent, and Jesus says, they will receive a greater condemnation. Hebrews chapter 13, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, listen, as those who will have to give an account. Your leaders will have to give an account for how they have led and with a dirty heart and with a self-promoting agenda, they will receive a greater condemnation. Just as these scribes were promised a greater condemnation. 
And for all of those 21st, 20th and 21st century televangelists out there trying to, to pilfer from the needy to get them to support their agenda will also receive a greater condemnation. And so what we see here is that we need to have a kingdom perspective of serving because Scripture says so. You know, in Mark chapter 9, we've already seen this account. Mark chapter 9, verse 33, um, they came to Capernaum. That's Jesus along with his disciples. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. These were his disciples. Jesus says, what were you talking about? Now, he knew what they were talking about on the road. What were you talking about on the road? And he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. That is a stark contrast to the scribes who wanted to be first of all, and that's it. Jesus said, not so with you. That's not the way we do things. That's not a kingdom perspective of serving because you're serving yourself. But instead, we serve others. The greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all, Jesus says. He reiterated this, really, in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 42. Mark chapter 10, verse 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But listen, it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Jesus is giving a kingdom perspective of serving. We don't serve ourselves. We serve God as we minister to other people. This ties into the greatest commandment. The first and the second great commandment is this. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second like is love your neighbor as yourself. Love God supremely. Love others sincerely. Serve with a pure heart. Others, not yourself. You see the connective tissue here. So this is what we need to understand. And the question is, do we have a kingdom perspective for serving? Do we, Calvary Bible Church, have a kingdom perspective for serving? It doesn't have to be manifest if we have a worldly view of serving like the scribes. It doesn't have to be manifest as taking advantage of other people as the scribes did or as unscrupulous televangelists do. Christians, ministry workers, participants in the Lord's work, I ask of you, who are you serving? Really, who are you serving? Really, if we're serving God, then it's going to be manifest in the manner in which we serve. We're going to care greatly, most greatly, about God receiving all the glory. We will care very little about what we actually get. We're going to care about him. And it's going to be manifest as we deal with people within our respective ministries. How do we deal with them? As pawns in a game that we are playing? How do we deal with them? As a means to an end? How do we deal with them? As trash that can be trampled in order to get to what, where we want to go and, and what we want? You see? The question is, who are we serving? If we're serving God... If we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength, then we're going to love the people that we serve with. Whether we, they do it the way we want them to do it or, or not, we're going to love people because we first love God. That is a kingdom perspective of serving. You'll listen to them. You'll, you'll, you'll care about them. You'll be gracious towards them. Man, that is a lost art in our society today. Where is the grace? May that not be so in the church. If anywhere people should feel that they 
are, are being extended a measure of grace, it's got to be here. If it ain't here, I don't know where we're going to have the opportunity to experience the grace of God manifest in people's behaviors towards one another. Amen? If we serve in the flesh according to our desired outcomes and according to what we want and according to how we want it, then we don't have a kingdom perspective for serving. Wearsby says this, quote, If a person is important only because of the uniform he wears, the title he bears, or the office he holds, then his importance is artificial. It's character that makes a person valuable, and nobody can give you character. You must develop it as you walk with God. Good words. Genuine Christians understand how to live the Christian life because, number one, they have a kingdom perspective of Christ. They have a proper Christology. He is from the line of David. That makes him David's son. But he is divine. God in the flesh. God incarnate. He is God the Son, the Son of God. That's the most important component of his identity. And they will have a kingdom perspective of serving. They will serve others because of the first and second great commandment. Number three, they will have a kingdom perspective of giving. Enter the widow's might. It doesn't use that word, but in the old King James, King James it does. The, the story of the widow's might. They have a kingdom perspective for giving. Let's read verses uh, 41 to 44 as we close today. And he sat down, after he says, beware of the scribes, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. So here's the scene. It's the temple treasury. Jesus was sitting with his disciples near the temple treasury, watching people depositing money. They would come into those outer courts, and they would drop money into the offering receptacles. The court of women had 13 such receptacles, and the people could cast their money in as they walked by. So copper coins striking metal because the receptacles were made out of metal, and you hear a ding. And, and, they would, and if you had more coins to throw into that receptacle, the, 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 the ding would become louder and louder and more numerous, and it could make quite a chatter, quite, quite a clatter, rather. And so these, these 13 receptacles and, and people coming and casting their money in as they walk by. In, in verse 41, Jesus watched as the rich were contributing large sums of money, many coins, and they would drop those things in. But along came this widow, Verse 42, with two small copper coins, which they qualify for us, makes a penny. It was the smallest denomination of coins. And so the widow put her coins into the box. You know, the widow, these widows who were victimized by unscrupulous lawyers in Jesus' day called scribes who were willing to take their inheritance from them and add it to their coffers and add it to their growing wealth that they were amassing for themselves on the backs of widows, those widow, that widow is here and she comes and she just has two smallest of the lowest denomination of coins. She just has two of them, she drops them in. And Jesus called his disciples to him and says, look, verse 43 he calls them, he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Now just stop right there. His disciples must be saying, Really? We just saw all the, we listened to all the clanking going on. What do you mean she put in more? Well, here's the lesson from this. Remember, this is all about a kingdom perspective of giving. Think a distinction between quantity and quality. 
Kingdom giving is more about quality of the giving than the quantity of the gift. Three important lessons that we see. Number one, God sees what man overlooks. God sees what man overlooks. Jesus saw what no one else did. He saw the humble gift of a poor widow. A humble gift. She was humble. This was the gift that Jesus thought was worth commendation. Not the big gifts that jingled. That's what the scribes wanted everyone to see. That's what the wealthy wanted everyone to see. The, the clanking coins going through those, those receptacles, they wanted them to see that, and that's what everyone saw because it made a sound, and I would have to imagine that probably flashed some light that may have been reflective off of it. It was very obvious who was giving the most, and they wanted it that way. This was the gift that the disciples needed to be aware of, the gift of the humble widow, this poor woman's gift. Listen, it demonstrated a kingdom perspective of giving. Number two, God judges the heart, not appearances. God judges the heart, not appearances. Verse 43, the widow's two small copper coins added up to a penny. But Jesus said that woman gave more. She had given more than anyone else that day. How could this be? Because in verse 41, many rich people put in large sums. The answer is proportion. Like I said, it was about quality of the gift, not the quantity of the gift. It's about proportion. The rich gave large sums but retained their fortunes. It says that the poor widow put in everything she had and all she had to live on. So we know, we can conclude that God sees what man overlooks. Man is looking at the outside. God sees on the inside. God judges the heart. God doesn't judge appearances. This poor woman's gift demonstrated a kingdom perspective of giving. And that is because she, apparently, we would see that God, that she loves God with all her heart, soul, mind, and strength, and she loves others. And she loved the opportunity to give what, by our standards, she wasn't even capable of giving. Because what are you going to live on? Isn't that what faith promises? Right? Don't we say, don't, don't judge your finances and decide, well, what can I carve out here for faith promise? Because where's the faith in that promise? Right? It's a matter of, what does God want me to give? And then whatever it is that he wants me to give, well, he's going to supply what I need to be able to give. Right? It's the same principle. And so, point number three here. I think we see with this poor widow is that God loves a faithful giver. God loves a faithful giver. Yes, God loves a cheerful giver because the faithful giver will be cheerful as they give because they're not clenching it. They have open hands. So consider this. The poor widow was in need of benevolence. She was the one needing the coins, but she wanted to give. What she gave by our standards, was negligible. Two small coins, which equal a penny? What are we going to do with that? It doesn't matter. God could take one small coin that equals half a penny, and he can multiply that, right? Jesus knew that it was an offering given in faith, and the poor widow gave what she had in faith, believing that God could use whatever it was that she gave. Her faith was also evident in the fact that she gave the last, it says, of what she had. I, I don't, we don't have time to go there now, but in 1 Kings chapter 17, there was a widow of Zarephath who gave her last meal to Elijah, and the poor widow in the temple gave away her last means of, of self-support. Do you see the connection between the two? This is a, this is a kingdom principle. Whether we talk, we talk about an Old Testament account or a New Testament account, does it mean that she left the temple completely destitute, went home, and died of starvation? I don't think so. Because Matthew chapter 6 talks about God providing for our needs, right? We don't know the details of the poor widow's future, but we can be certain that she was provided for. Jesus saw her heart. Jesus knew that she came in all humility, and she gave sacrificially. 
We have to believe that because of how she gave that she was provided for, her needs. It doesn't mean that she gave that small portion and, and, and as the, uh, uh, the, uh, the health and wealth gospel preachers would say, she had a multi- will have it multiplied a hundredfold. There's no guarantee of that. But what she did was she gave because out of the purity of her heart, she believed by faith that God would meet her needs. Her needs would be met. We have to believe that God was faithful to that. This poor woman's gift demonstrated a kingdom perspective of giving. So if we have a kingdom perspective, we'll see things as Jesus does. If we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength, and if we love others, then we're going to have a kingdom perspective of Christ. Concerning his person and work, we'll have a kingdom perspective. We'll see him for who he is and what he has done and continues to do. If we have a kingdom perspective of serving, then we are going to serve unselfishly. We're going to, see, we're, we're going to seek that Christ is exalted, not ourselves. We don't care if we get recognition. We don't care if we get accolades. We don't care if our agenda moves forward. We care that God's work is done. And if we have a kingdom perspective of giving, we're going to give by faith, not by what's safe. So a evidence that we are living the Christian life can be seen here in this passage. Kingdom perspective of Christ, of serving, and of giving. I'll end with this quote from Wearsby once again. Warren Wearsby said, quote, Pride of living and pride of giving are sins we must avoid at all cost. How tragic that the leaders depended on a religious system that shortly would pass off the scene. Do you know there would be no need for these scribes? When that temple was destroyed in 70 AD, that temple came crashing down, and all of their profiteering that was done inside of there is now gone and laid to waste. How wonderful that the common people gladly listened to Jesus and obeyed his word. In which group are you? Father in heaven, I thank you so much that you have given to us this account, that we can be instructed by it. I thank you that in this, uh, in this account, which ties so nicely back to Jesus' teaching in the temple about the great commandment to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as ourselves, that we have a kingdom principle here of being wholly devoted to you and therefore to each other. I thank you for the example that we have been given of how to live our lives, having a proper view of Christ, allowing Christ to guide our daily living, how to have a proper view of serving each other within the church, how we do so not selfishly but unselfishly, seeking Christ's exaltation and not our own, and how to give by faith, not because it's safe. And I thank you, Father, for giving us these kingdom principles to live by. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.